and you're all set. All right, guys, welcome to the April strategic planning meeting. Um, prior to any new business, do we have any questions, concerns involving the minutes from the March meeting? No, I looked them over and everything looks good. Yeah, it seemed good. Okay, well, Brute, then I guess we're ready to get started. All right, uh, so tonight uh, we don't have any new policies for this month. Um, the they uh got held up um a little bit at the end of last month so the ones that we talked about last month was when uh, miss weaver was here and we talked about um a lot of our title one policies those will be going up for uh first reading at next next week's uh meeting uh so tonight we wanted to spend a little bit of time looking at and sharing some information as a follow-up uh, from some of the scheduling work um, that that we've been doing over the last couple months um, in anticipation of uh, trying to launch a new bell schedule uh, at State Road Campus for grades seven through 12 next year. So I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> uh, is everyone able to see that the presentation slides? All right, great. Um, so uh, wanted to start off with, and this is a this is a, a slide that was shared um, by the ISM consultant uh, who came and visited uh, and helped us with the schedule analysis back in November. Um, and I thought it was a, a telling slide and it, it started off his presentation. So I wanted to share it here tonight. Um, and, and it's about how impactful the master schedule of a school can be and what it says about the school, the, the school's history, the school's culture, its philosophy, um, and its priorities. Um, so, you know, the, the schedule in terms of minutes is not just, um, it's not just an operational thing that, and that mechanism that we utilize throughout the day to move from place to place. Um, but it really does impact a lot of what we do. It impacts the people that work at, at our school and what their days look like, our kids and our staff and our teachers. It impacts the time of our day, um, when we start, when we end, what programs we're able to offer um, during the day and before and after school, as well as what our space, our physical plant management um, is able to maintain and look like. It feeds into the professionalism of, of our staff and the environment that they work in, the teaching pedagogy and, and, and teaching philosophy that you're able to um, utilize within the classrooms and within the school as a whole. Uh, it dictates the pace of day, and we're going to talk a little bit about pace of day tonight, um, uh, how students and staff move through their day, how um, that feels physically emotionally and, and sort of cognitively to different individuals uh, within, within the school, in the model that you're in, as well as sort of driving the purpose of what you're doing um, in the school. It feeds faculty culture and, and the student engagement and experience that, that students are going to have. Um, the experience of school is that it can be, for students can be different uh, based on the bell schedule and based on the operational sort of pace of day that the school goes through. Um, and then that kind of feeds into some of like the, the emotional and soft, uh, soft skilled base things that we're looking at about what, what's the well being of our staff and students look like, how are they performing? Um, are, are, are they uh, demonstrating or voicing satisfaction within the school and their jobs? Um, does our, does the, the schedule can impact our enrollment? Um, you know, if we're doing something, uh, similar to other school districts or different, or, you know, completely out of the box that, that, you know, that can drive some curiosity within the school system and maybe dr and impact enrollment as well as impact sort of the legacy of, of, of our school, um, and the quality of our school. And these are kind of intertwined. Like you can kind of go up and down this this info gra this graphic here um and see how a lot of them can be connected as you jump from tier to tier and it all really feeds back to what the the schedule says about and 
how it impacts the larger organization. So right now, this is this is what our, our current schedule looks like. Um, it's looked like this for a while. Um, this is our seven through 12 schedule. We it, and, and the times have even adjusted here and there with with some um, fluidity that's been needed with the beginning and end of our day. Uh, but as you move through the day, all of our, our, our periods are roughly 45 minutes long. Um, they, you know, we have a homeroom first period. We're starting with the morning bell. That period's a little bit longer because it has homeroom built into it. Um, and then students kind of progress through their day in 45 minute chunks with three minutes in between classes. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, you know they're, they're sort of sprinting through the day. They're 45 minutes in one class, then they're 45 minutes in another, and then they go to another, and then they go to another. Um, and that, that you know, if you're looking at this, making, um, when you look at this, you're looking at uh, with, a, with a period of the student schedule, both in middle school and high school being one of their lunch periods, that the most, cla most classes that a student can take in terms of uh, aggregating credits and accumulating credits is seven, seven classes. Um, however, many of our lab-based science classes, we have to, we utilize a floating, currently a floating lab period that eats up another one of, of students' periods of their day for a rotating lab period. So once every six days, a student will have a 90-minute science class. Um, for our AP classes, it's sometimes two, it's usually two uh, periods within the six-day cycle that they're getting a 90-minute period. But opposite that lab, uh, students are, are usually forced into a, to a study hall unless they elect to take a, um, an elective that's been pre-approved where students are allowed to miss you know, one to two classes every six days. Um, so it can be limiting. Uh, there's also a lot of transitions. You have, uh, you know, trans, you have getting to school, then a, tra you know, a transition between one and two, two and three, three and four, five, four and five, five and six, six and seven, and seven and eight. That's a lot of transitions through the day. And every one of those transitions at three minutes is lost instructional time. Um, kids, are, kids are moving throughout the campus. Uh, and in some instances, students have to move from one location to another. That takes more than three minutes. And we realize that from a from an operation standpoint, and the teachers realize that from an operation standpoint, but if it's taking five, six, seven minutes for kids to get to class, um, or if, you know, the uh, flexibility and grace that we provide students in moving to class is abused, that can be more and more time that's lost um, and not being allocated within the 45 minutes then that we actually have for class. So, um, a lot of what we had talked about with our the with Brian and ISM and the consultant and with um, some of the teachers that we have been meeting with and students is really like within this forty five minute period how much instruction is really happening. So if if a if a student's leaving at nine twenty three from period two and they're not arriving to class, we'll say say they get there at nine twenty six. Um, by the time they get into the class, they settle down, they transition, they get their work out, the teacher ends up transitioning them into what today's activities are. You're typically losing about six minutes on average at the beginning of each class. So now it's not in that second period going to the, into third, it's, you know, it's 9.32. Um, and then at the end of the class, students are typically watching the clock and they check out, you know, six minutes before. So within a 45 minute class period, you're really losing, you know, on average 12 minutes just in just due to transitioning back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So we were really looked at how many times that's happening through the day and how many how much time in minutes are being lost. How much instructional minutes are being lost due to the frequency of students needing to transition through a seven and eight period day. We also um, have been growing over the last couple of years and the lunchroom capacity has started to become a problem um, where it's getting difficult to get, you know, 400 and some high school students through the lunchroom in 45 minutes. Um, and again, losing some of that lunch period to transition. Um, 
And then this eight period day, it, it, it lacks some flexibility that we were looking at in terms of um, singleton classes be when they are offered, um, uh, course conflicts that occur, uh, how our tech schedule integrates with this and some of the class offerings that we're able or we're not able to give some of our TCHS students um, or those uh, looking to enroll in, in dual enrollment classes. Um, so th that's some of the constraints that we've run into uh, with with this schedule. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's been like this since I, since I came here. Um, Blaze, you, you know, we've been trying to do this for a while. You were a part of, of I think, two, two attempts to sort of look at this. Um, and, and these have kind of been constraints and issues that we've been seeing for a number of years. And as we've grown, those constraints have gotten like more and more difficult to manage. In terms of local comparisons, I went through and I thought it would be interesting just so that everybody can see what some of the local school districts around, um, around us do uh, just for, for comparison. So Avon Grove School District uh, runs an AB block schedule. Um, they actually originally had a, an AB drop block schedule prior to COVID, um, but but uh, once we returned to in-person learning, they adopted just a standard AB block schedule. Coatesville has an eight-period day schedule, similar to ours. Uh, Kennett does an AB block schedule with a flex period, um, so it's an it's an additional flex period that's built into their AB block schedule where they do some advisory work, um, and it's a time that that students have. Uh, to meet with teachers and, and things like that. Uh, Oxford runs an A through C block schedule. So they do A, B days, um, or it's B, C days, I forget which one. Two of the letter days, they run uh, alternating uh, elongated blocks of time, like an A, B block schedule. And then they one of the days, they have a single, single eight period day. Um, so they sort of do a, a modified hybrid of both a block schedule and an eight period day schedule. Uh, Owen J. Roberts has an eight day, an eight period day. Downingtown has an eight period day. Unionville has a nine period day. Uh, and Octorera has a six period block schedule. So instead of running a, uh, an AB block schedule typically has four periods in the day at a, anywhere between like 75 and 90 minutes. Octorera runs a six period rotating drop block schedule of 60 minute periods. So they have six 60 minute periods um, and then they rotate, they rotate classes through it. That, so certain, so it's kind of like a, you drop a period each day as you go through a, a, a cycle of, of um, days. So within sort of our surrounding school districts, you, so you still have a mix of schools that have um, adopted and moved to a, a block schedule and some that are still on, on eight period day schedules. Um, Avangrove changed their schedule. I believe it was like 2016. Um, uh, Can it just change theirs? Um, Oxford's been running their A, a to C block schedule for a while. Um, and Octorera has run their six period drop block schedule for, for a long time as well. So just uh, a, a sort of a local comparison. So when we were looking at um, revisiting our, our bell schedule and what we wanted to see uh, for the school and for our teachers and for our learners, uh, we, we, we were trying to accomplish a number of things. So, so a lot of what we talked about was trying to improve the pace of day for middle school and high school students. Um, that has to do with the, the number, decreasing the number of transitions and interruptions to their day. Um, and by focusing on the pace of day, we were then uh, a byproduct of that was that we wanted to make sure that we were increasing learning opportunities for students um, and, and trying to find ways to increase the total credit opportunities that kids could take um, to give our teachers and our students the time to be able to engage in deeper and deeper learning and more active learning. Um, to increase the flexibility that we have within, a, within the schedule to meet both teacher and student needs. Um, I already mentioned the transitions and interruptions to better facilitate uh, interventions that need to occur uh, within our middle school and high school club offerings, as well as activities and how, we, and how we're doing that. Um, to maximize the efficiency of our, both our human resources, our people, 
our teachers, our staff, as well as the physical space of our, of our campus. Um, and then also to address the mental health stress and time uh, for mental health stress and time for our students and teachers. Um, so, you know, it goes back to how many classes a student has in a day, how many, the cognitive load that kids need to, are subjected to within a particular day, the amount of homework that kids have uh, going home um, each day on top of a full day of school and jobs and activities and sports, sort of like what, what, what does that, that just that, that load look like on on students, as well as teachers having to do multiple preps within a particular day, see, you know, over a hundred kids um, in a in one day. Uh, is there a better way to, to facilitate learning and meet our mission and vision um, while keeping the mental health and stress of, of students and teachers in mind? Uh, so we were, we spent a lot of time talking about period length and what sort of we wanted to see. And, and in order to uh, meet the goal of being able to provide an environment where teachers are able to prov to give students opportunities for deeper learn and more active learning. You need time, and you need. And in, a, in another slide, you're going to see sort of the difference between horizontal and vertical time. Um, we 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 needed more concentrated time, or our belief is we needed more concentrated time to allow teachers to engage in. Um, deeper discussions, more group work, um, the ability to have them break out into smaller group instruction, similar to what our elementary teachers do, um, and give them more time to differentiate within their individual classes, which is, which, which is hard to do when you have a 45 minute period, but only really, you know, 33 minutes, if you're lucky of, of, instructional time when you factor in those transitions. Um, so what we were looking at is, is um, really that, that this concept of time and how do we use our time? Um, because not all minutes are the same um, and minutes, not all, not all minutes are the same. Uh, minutes do not need to equal each other in order to be equal. Um, we talked a little bit about, about the equity of time and then the differences between vertical, horizontal, and longitudinal time. So these are, these are sort of three intermeshed um, concepts that we discussed and needed to look at when thinking about instruction, aggregate instructional time within each course period and class and, and discipline. Um, so we looked at, at vertical time, which is the length of a particular period in a single day. So how much time are we giving um, uh, seat time to students in a vertical nature in a single period of time within a single day? Horizontal time is then how that looks over, say, a number of meetings within a cycle or the number of days in a cycle. So uh, you could meet Within a, within say a six a six day cycle, you could be uh, you could have a class that meets two days every six, three days every six, six days every six, um, or that is just for a six day cycle. Or do you run a four day cycle or a two day cycle? Um, so when you're looking at the number of meetings per cycle as well as the number of days that you have within a cycle, those multiplied by each other end up giving you the number of total instructional minutes that you have within a given period of time, which would be your cycle. And then it's longitudinal time. So um, how much time are then we looking in the aggregate over terms, whether that's quarters, semesters, or the entire length of year? And then how many times does your established cycle occur within a single year? If you have a six-day cycle, that typically will rotate through about 30 times within a 180-day school year. Um, so they kind of all feed off each other to say how much total time or minutes does a class have? Now, total time, you can look at that very differently because teachers and staff can use time differently, more efficiently, um, differently so that one minute in my class is not necessarily the same as one minute in Mr. Messick's class or, you know, I think time is used differently. 
And um, I, I, I would put in here sort of just an, an example of how time can be looked at differently uh, with, with horizontal and vertical time um, in, in a scenario that is very similar to what we're looking at. So right now we run, four, we run um, 45 minute periods. Uh, so in this example right here, uh, there are a lot of schools, um, even in the, the models that we just shared that are district comparisons that have 40 and 42 minute periods. So if you look at two 40 minute periods over two days, that's a total of 80 minutes, right? You got two, two, two 40 minute periods is 80 minutes total. But if we are looking at and, and sort of agreeing that about six to six and a half minutes at the front and end of each period is, I would almost say wasted, but it's not, it's not usually utilized towards core instructional activities because of the transitioning in and out of class, the cognitive switch that students have to make from say, I'm in math class and now I need to kind of switch into English mode. Um, and then just the teacher even transitioning of, I just had a group of kids in here. Now I got a new group coming in and I got to shift my way of thinking. Um, not to mention if it's a completely different prep in class that they have to kind of shift, shift their mindset. Um, over those two days, that teacher is really only getting 54 minutes of effective teaching time when you take out the 13 minutes between the two periods of the day. Now, if I take the same 80 minutes and I put it in a longer vertical time block, and I still assume the same six and a half minutes of transition, I'm actually now getting 67 minutes of effective teaching time or about 25% more time within my class period devoted to instruction, sound instructional time, as opposed to if I had the same 80 minutes split between two days. So that's where we were looking at how time can be looked at differently, depending upon how you might stack time vertically um, or, or, or stretch it horizontally. And then what does that look like over the, the span of, of an entire year? Uh, any questions on, on that so far before I get into, into some of the more visuals of the models of the model that we were, we were looking at? Oh, that was a, a little bit of a much. All right. So, um, and I'm going to show you this in a, in a couple different formats uh, so that, that you can look at it, at it a little bit differently. Um, so what uh, we were, were working on and, and one of the proposals that came out of ISM's um, uh, evaluation and recommendations was to move to a schedule that, created more vertical time um, and give, give, uh, give longer periods of instructional time for our teachers to be able to engage in um, that, that deeper, more active learning activities. So um, within our, our current uh, model at State Road, one of the constraints that we have is we have a lot of crossover teachers um, that move between the middle school and the high school, as well as students who move between middle school and come up to particularly high school math classes. So when we were looking at a schedule model, we were trying to find ways to make sure that the seventh and eighth grade schedule had a number of match points throughout the day that were congruent with the high school schedule so that Teachers still had some ability to be fluid and move between, say, I'm a um, middle school uh, art teacher, I'm a specials teacher, but I also teach high school art classes. So we wanted to make sure that there, were still, there was still flexibility and fluidity within the two models, but also realize that what the high school needs is different than what the middle school needs. And right, and you know, since I've been here and looking at that eight period schedule, that was often um, a what the high school needed and sort of forcing the middle school to just adopt that model and um, figure out how to make it work. And whether that was adding more classes to make the middle school fit the high school and adding more staff to make the middle school fit the high school, um, just just for for it to be able to fit within the puzzle. Um, so we were again, we're trying to find ways to 
uh, meet the needs of the high school, meet the needs of the middle school, but also then still provide flexibility between the two. So here on the left-hand side, you'll see what um, uh, the schedule would particular what would look like. And again, I'm going to show you a couple different ways of what this what this looks like visually. Um, but it would be a, a, uh, all seven through twelfth grade operating on a uh, day one, day two, or an A day, B day type schedule. Um, in the high school, on the left hand side, the first two periods of the day would be 80 minute periods. Um, the third period of the day would be an 85 minute period. And we're still trying, we're, we can still fle uh, flex a little bit the start and end times of these, pe of these periods. Uh, this was just working off um, sort of even five minute increments. Uh, you'll notice that in between, we did build transition time into uh, the schedule. Uh, and we actually increased it from three minutes to five minutes. Um, we think that five minutes is, is, is an ample enough time to move across the campus. Um, it, it is respectful of our students and saying, we realize that you might need a little bit of, of transition time to move from place to place, uh, but also respectful of our teachers where um, we believe students should be able to get to their classes and uh, in that amount of time and that teachers, you know, that's enough flexibility for teachers to be able to toe the line of saying, if you're not on time, I'm gonna hold you accountable for being on time. Um, and so you'll see that, that that's five minute transitions. One of the things uh, of, and, and that uh, the ISM consultant talked about was the concept of transition time and not publishing transition time in a schedule. Um, and that sort of the psychology behind it where if we tell students you have five minutes to transition, they'll, they'll meander and wander for five minutes and still show up late to class, right? Um, because it's, it's kind of just the psychology behind that in, as an adolescent. Um, but if you didn't put that in there and you said class one ends at 9.05 and class two end, starts at 9.05, that they'll, they'll make their way to class and you're still allowing for transition, but you're not really telling them how much they have. So they'll, they'll get there as quick as possible because you haven't sort of published. You've kind of got five minutes to waste here. They'll, they'll move from point A to point B in the straightest line possible because they know they got to get there as quick as possible. That's a little bit different, not something that we've done. Um, there are some, some state requirements in terms of, of how we have to report some things uh, that, that we, we decided to um, leave transition time in there and increase it to five minutes. Um, you'll then see the high school lunch period was, um, was, uh, sort of elongated to 60 minutes as opposed to 45, but that'll actually be a, uh, what we're proposing is a split lunch um, where one group of high school students will eat for the first 30 minutes and a second group will be in clubs and activities and potentially advisory during that first half of lunch. And then they will switch. And then that, that first group will go to lunch. And the, the first group that was eating lunch will go to clubs, activity clubs, activities, and potentially advisory, um, and that the lunch period that students will be in will sort of be dependent upon the club's activities that they're involved in. And the teacher's lunch will also sort of mirror that. So if I am a, um, if I am the coach of the academic competition, I might be meeting, be able to be meeting with my club during the first 30 minutes of lunch and learn. And then the second half of, of lunch and learn would be my lunch as a teacher. And then the students in academic competition would go to their lunch as well. Um, so, so it's, it's uh, looking at um, trying to facilitate both clubs and activities happening during that hour, uh, having teachers be available for extra help, for completing tests and quizzes, things of that nature, and that students are scheduling themselves for either A or B lunch or first or second lunch, whatever we end up calling it, based on their needs. Um, based on if they need to see a teacher, if they are in a particular club, um, based on their advisory group. Uh, so we have some flexibility within that hour of the day. Um, we also moved, you'll see that lunch for high school doesn't fit in the middle of the day. The cafeteria schedule of trying to run fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh and eighth, and all of high school all through one lunch line um, 
is another major constraint that we have. Uh, but you'll see that we didn't we didn't uh, you, you, we didn't plop um, high school lunch right in the middle of the day because um, we want to continue to be able to offer early release to our high school students and get them out of the building as early as possible. Not because we don't want them there, but kids who have early release and are not participating in any clubs or activities are now able to leave at 12 o'clock as opposed to 1230. Um, and those are less students that are in the lunchroom to help uh, be a release valve for some of those physical space constraints that we have. Uh, we're also able to get students out if they're participating in dual enrollment classes a little bit earlier in the afternoon so that they can have additional travel time to those classes. Uh, so for example, we have a partnership with Westchester University, um, but their dual enrollment classes are at the Graduate Center or some of their in-person classes are at the Graduate Center in Westchester. Uh, and there was never enough time for students to travel there. By adding another 30 minutes available for travel time, students would now have enough time to, to get to the Graduate Center if they wanted to enroll in a dual enrollment course with Westchester University. Um, and then we'll, we'll transition to the last period of the day, which is the second uh, or a third 80 minute it period. Um, if you move over now, you're looking at the eighth and seventh and eighth grade schedule. Uh, you'll see that they also operate on a day one, day two, day one, day two, or A day, B day schedule. So alternating. Um, you'll see that the first two periods of the day uh, are both 80 minute periods. And this is where you see the sort of congruency between the high school and the middle school schedule. So it's during that first and second block on either day one or day two that high school or middle school students would be able to be coming up into either high school world language or high school math classes. Um, and those were those matching, matching match points through the day. Um, you then see that we have uh, an everyday advisory period for 20 minutes built into our middle school schedule. Um, one of, some of our high school schedule models had an everyday advisory built into it, uh, but we thought that having that be a scheduled part of the lunch and learn period and taking the instructional time that was being devoted to the advisory period in the high school schedule and pushing that back into the instructional periods was more important. And that was that allowed us to move from a 75 minute period to an 80 and, an, and or an 85 minute period and give our core teachers a little bit more instructional time. But in the middle school, we're seeing a lot of need for, um, for a lot of those social, emotional and advisory based topics. How do you deal with conflict? Um, how do you be good digital citizens? Um, just, just a whole host of things that are going on in our, in our, in the middle school and just that age group that needs that focus time for reflection. Um, so I know that Ms. Uh, Taylor's on, um, and, uh, Ms. Ms. Lambert was, uh, doing some evaluations of, of curriculum, um, that we were, uh, looking to adopt to help support that middle school advisory program. Um, and then the advisory was at would actually occur for eighth grade at the on the tail end of their second period um, on either day one or day two. So that C and D block, they would stay with that teacher that they have, whether it's their this the teacher that they have for second block or that C period or D period, that is then feeding into their advisory. So they don't transition to a new place for advisory. So we're saving transition time. Uh, and they would stay with their teacher and get that, that advisory focused lesson. And then they would go to lunch. Um, the eighth and seventh grade lunch periods in our current schedule now is 45 minutes. It's a way too long um, for middle schoolers. They get themselves in trouble with 45 minutes of, of lunch and an unstructured time. Um, so we were dialing that back to 30. Uh, and by dialing it back to 30, we were able to, if you look across, split seventh and eighth grade lunch. So right now, all of seventh grade and eighth grade eat together. It's a lot of kids eating at one particular time. Um, and it's also a coverage issue that we have um, of having to pull teachers 
and support staff to uh, monitor all of that. So we were able to split high school lunch or middle school lunch. I apologize. Eighth grade then goes into their next um, 80 minute period. They then have their encore or specials block, which is uh, an hour long and uh, which is 15 minutes longer than it is now. So we stretched out their um, specials and encore period from 45 to an hour and decreased Wolfpack hour from 45 to 30 minutes. So middle schoolers will st still have Wolfpack hour. That is still when they will have their clubs and activities um, and interventions. And uh, Mrs. Lambert is working on uh, restructuring what Wolfpack hour looks like and, and having it be more service focused and service learning focused for our middle school students. Um, but that had that had been reduced by 15 minutes and that allowed us to reallocate those 15 minutes within the school day. Seventh grade is very similar. It's the same same um, structure sort of of tiles. They're just moved in a little bit of a different position. So um, same beginning of the day, then they go to Encore for an hour, then they go to lunch, then they transition from lunch to advisory, which would be either their E or F period teacher. So they would go to advisory, stay in that room, and then go into their next class. And then they transition to Wolfpack hour. And Wolfpack hour occurs at the same time for both seventh and eighth grade. And is also the last thing in the day. Um, we had discussions about where the best placement of Wolfpack hour was um, and uh, continue to come back to having it at the end of the day so that if um, students have early dismissals uh, or leaving sp for sports or things like that, that they're not missing math or English. They might be missing um, their club or activity. Uh, and that was, that was something that we thought was important. Um, not that they miss, but that if we had to pick or choose, are you going to be able to miss um, a club or are you going to miss 30 minutes of core math instruction? It was probably more important that you were in math. Um, if just to see it a couple different ways, um, this was this was still vertical looking uh, with, with your color coding. If you are um, more of a want to see it horizontally, it looks something like this, um, where you have seventh and eighth grade. Uh, we also built an alternative eighth grade schedule that that could work um, and still sort of lay over the high school and uh, schedule in seventh grade when their encore periods happen, how lunch is going to work, um, what the gym schedule is going to look like, because the gym is also a, a constraint that I had mentioned previously, and then how this affects element, the elementary classroom. Um, and then we also went through the time calculations. So then um, this is all something that we're going to, I'm going to look to share at the board meeting next week um, with, with the, the larger board and, and then take questions. Um, something that we shared at the last board meeting, but I wanted to reiterate and talk about again here, uh, was uh, what our plan is, our, our tentative plan is moving forward for health and PE uh, for the next couple of years while we make this schedule transition and start construction on the new academic building at State Road. Um, so right now, I mentioned we have a single gym space. It's a major constraint within the building site to try to get fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and high school gym classes all through one gym space that is not big enough to have two gym classes happening at the same time. Um, any, any schedule changes that we were looking to make, um, oftentimes we ran into a barrier and that barrier was either the lunchroom or the gym. Um, and as we start construction uh, or plan, plan to start construction, that's going to significantly limit outdoor space for both PE and for recess. Uh, now, that, some of that depends on what the final timelines and site work schedule is going to tell us about um, construction entrances and, and where all that work is going to happen within specific phases. But we realize and we know that it is going to impact our outdoor space to, to, a, to a degree for both PE and recess at State Road. 
Um, so what we had proposed and talked about at the last board meeting, and it feeds into the schedule conversation, is that in the interim, while we are waiting for, uh, while this building project is happening and we're operating under the constraints of our, our single physical uh, gym space and, and no and little to no outdoor space to be able to hold um, outdoor PE, that uh, while this, is, this transition is occurring, that we look to offer um, our high school students their physical education class in an online format um, with a curriculum partnership. Uh, so uh, we, we were evaluating different curriculum partnerships um, and uh, are looking to enter into agreement with um, Care One Learning. Uh, they focus specifically in the development of health, fitness, and career education online classes for high school and middle schools. What's nice about um, this vendor is that they offer um, a common cartridge integration within to Schoology uh, so that students who are taking this online physical education class, they're not having to go to an outside um, LMS system, which is, I think, a major hurdle that we see with students taking online classes that are not successful in it. It's just simply they forget about it because it's not in their face every day where this company is able to integrate um, their course curriculum into Schoology, into our Schoology platform, so that students will see that course every day when they log into Schoology, it will be there amongst all of their other classes. So when they go to log in to get their social studies work, their PE class will be looking at them. Um, and our plan is that our, our staff, um, Mr. McGeehan, will be the staff member who will be monitoring, grading, and checking in with students as the teacher of record for this PE class, um, which I think is a, is a big difference between taking asynchronous or even synchronous PE without direct contact or the ability to check in with a physical staff member. Um, these students are still in our building every day, and that means Mr. McGeehan can easily go during lunch and learn um, or student study hall periods to grab them and check in on them and make sure that they're keeping up with the requirements of this PE class, as opposed to just sort of the students being left to their own device and having to do it on their own time and self-manage it themselves. So the plan that we were, we were proposing and we talked about at the last board meeting was that next year, um, we would look to have all 10th through 12th grade students who have not taken PE yet uh, be given this course. Uh, I audited the students' grades and historical records, and it comes out to be approximately 110 students next year. Uh, and we would also offer this over the summer uh, with Mr. McGeehan uh, running the class over the summer. So a portion of that 110 students could elect to take the class over the summer and sort of just get it out of the way. And then the 24-25 school year, uh, all 10th graders would be given the PE course with optional enrollment for 9th graders. We would also offer that class over the summer as a summer option uh, so students could, could take it and get it out of the way. And then in 25-26, uh, depending upon the opening of the building, so that's what that asterisk is, is there. So if we if the building is not ready for the beginning of the 25 26 school year or um a, a decent entry point within that school year like at the semester break or something like that then we would be looking to have all ninth graders take this this pe class and any remaining 10th graders who maybe it didn't work out in the 24 25 school year be given to it as well as it being a summer option over the summer 2025 and then if worst case scenario, we weren't able to get into the new building and have in-person PE return until the beginning of the 26, that uh, should be 26, 27. I apologize for the typo. Um, that's when we would transition back to in-person PE classes in the new and larger gym space that actually allows us to run multiple gym classes at one particular time um, with, the, with the planned section divider in the, in the gymnasium space. Um, it's at that time we would also be oops, we'd also be looking to expand our PE and health department offerings, um, offering both PE classes and expanding into items like um, 
uh, weightlifting with the, with the new fit, fitness center that's, th that's being planned, um, nutritional and wellness classes, expanding on our health offerings, offering classes like CPR training um, to, to give students more, more options there. Uh, and the course that we were looking, uh, that we evaluated um, was the, was Care One's Learning's Fitness Fundamentals One class. Uh, this is sort of the unit breakdown. It's a six unit uh, course. It's planned typically to be done within a semester. It focuses on um, some fundamental of fitness assessments, uh, things you need to know about how to be fit, warming up cooling down, posture, stretching, um, fit principles, how to take your heart rate and what it means, nutrition, weight loss, and drug drug awareness. Uh, so so it's, it's a very basic and um, traditional PE class focus. Uh, students would still take health uh, in person in the classroom. This is just the, the PE class. And then within that class, students do a uh, specific lesson focus. They have uh, discussion boards. They do specific assignments and quizzes based on the content of the lessons. And then they have to keep a fitness log that is submitted to the teacher of record and monitored throughout the, uh, the 18 weeks of the class. So that's, that's sort of what we were looking at in moving forward uh, in a present, with a presentation to the board next week potentially a fo more follow-up in May as we continue to, to work out some of the additional logistics that come with, with any major changes like this, along with, with planned and construction that's coming up, um, but wanted to pause now and see if there are any general questions. Um, anyone else who was in, I see you know some of the administration is here, if they wanna jump in and discuss or provide any additional insights or things that I might've missed. Uh, but also open for discussion and questions. This is like big. Nobody's got nobody's got a question. So, I have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> have we heard feedback from teachers and students about the optional schedule change? So I was just going to say that, Charity, this is one of those grading situations mm -hmm. where everybody has a different opinion. Okay. And t some kids understand, like I've already gotten kids say to me, even my own child, you know, what does this mean I'm going to lose? And I think change is hard for people and some people can see the positive things and some people are afraid of change and what it means to them. And so, you know, I think what's really important is that we weigh in what's important for kids learning for teachers. Um, you know, a lot of the teachers are happy. What I hear are they're really happy about the, the, the extra time, the prep periods, the um, not eight periods a day where they're constantly jumping from thing and having science um, labs that are longer and not, disjointed. So there are real learning things that I'm hearing that are amazing gains. What I hear in, in a negative aspect is some of them have been teaching for a very long time, those 45 minute periods, and they've done it their whole life. And now they have to change their lesson plans and, and they don't want more work. They don't want to do that. So, you know, it is, it is back and forth about pros and cons. But I think what's really important here is what are we gaining and is it enough that everybody agrees? And that's why the strategic planning committee is so important because this is your opportunity to work some of those things out. We have teachers on here. We have parents on here. We have administrators on here. And so we can talk through some of those things to make recommendations or, or share opinions about whether we think those outweigh you know, what decisions are, be, are going to be recommended to the board? Some of it's also the approach and the mindset of, of, of maybe relooking at your negative in a positive. So um, like, you know, I, I could think of uh, students saying, oh man, in this schedule, you're telling me I'm going to have to sit with in a class that I don't like, right? Like I, I got to sit in my math class for 
80 minutes as opposed to 45. Well, well, yeah, but then the next day you don't have math at all. Right. So like you, you, you can, it's sometimes the lens at which you're looking through some of the, uh, of, of, of what, you know, are you a glass half empty or glass half full person, but also the lens that you're looking through. Um, but I, I think that Mrs. Bishop hit some, some important parts of, you know, this is also, you know, we've had a lot of our high school teachers that teach multiple prep periods and lots of kids, um, as long with, along with middle school of, of, of needing preparation time. Um, and this moves them from, a, from a, a 45 minute prep or prep time every day to our high school teachers getting 80 minutes. Um, and our, our middle school student teachers, you know, having only 45, now they're getting an hour. Uh, so we were trying to find ways to be able to increase the time that teachers need in order to um, grade and, and prepare and, and transition. Um, you know, I, I think from a, from a student's perspective, I now, I got, I have four classes a day that I really have to focus on. Yes, I'm in them longer, but it's not eight. Uh, and, and that's, that's, eight's a lot. Um, I, I'll tell you when I, I haven't been in the classroom for a while, but when you go in and you, you, uh, you substitute, like it's a long day transitioning between eight different classes. And I'll tell you when I shadowed that student a couple of years ago, I was exhausted through that many transitions of having to go, you know, from class to class to class to class and just cognitively have to make those shifts. Now they're, they're really only having to make, they're only transitioning from class to class twice from A to C, that first transition A to C, and then from C to E block on like that first day, then they have lunch and then they go to their last class as opposed to having multiple class to class transitions. And I think too, what's important is one of the things we're struggling with is substitute coverage. And the teachers are very discouraged about that in particular. And this is allowing us to not cover as many classes um, and helping with that, with that issue as well. I know there's so a I'm lot. A te- of- Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. I was just say, if I'm a teacher and I'm off today and I don't have sub coverage, the rest of the staff is having to cover potentially seven academic periods of my schedule for the day. And now they're only going to have to sk- cover three because one of them is my prep um, or, or they would have to cover six. And now they're only having to cover three. Uh, so we're able to be a little bit more um, efficient with, with our staff, as well as our hope is not take staff from that needed prep time to have to cover classes as, as much. Yeah. You have a couple comments too. Um, William Ahern said that he had this type of schedule in high school a long time ago. He supports the change, makes a lot of sense, a lot smoother transitions. Miss Lambert, the principal of the middle schools on here, Jerry Ann, she said, I'm currently meeting with each middle school teacher this week, discuss concerns so far, everyone is very supportive and excited about the increase of the instructional time to better support students. Caitlin Leonard, special ed director, wrote, I love that this schedule is based on research and merging needs with the science behind learning. Often what preferred isn't the best. Right, I, I, I think this is a great idea. I like the flexibility that it brings. Um, especially for high school students and the courses that they're going to be able to take. Uh, I would say the only concerns that I could that pop in my head right away would be professional development for teachers. I mean, there's certainly going to be a, a transition period, probably of at least a year, right? Like it's going to take a whole year to, for them to really lesson plan differently. And, and like you said, with pedagogy and how they're teaching things like that's going to be a transition. It's going to take some time. And it'll take some time for kids. Um, the only thing that I would say from a scheduling perspective here would be that advisory period for eighth grade, right? Like that hundred and what uh, hour and forty minutes, like that's a lot. So, so you know, Jerry, Jerry Ann wrote in here that she, the middle school teachers, are extremely excited about the advisory, and and Ryan wrote, love the advisory. Um, Ryan and Jerry, and do you want to talk to Blaze? Because I do know that yeah, so, that that, that advisory it, period structure is really important because yeah, the it can't fall on one person. 
well, the advisor so is a it, great idea, Chris, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying the time within that one actual classroom. For well, the yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think we can we can right. we'll build in opportunities for them to have like, you know, a a, a break within that 140 minutes. Yeah, I think it'd be. Better and, and the goal is that if now I now have a, a an 80 minute period like that C block for eighth grade. That they're not just sitting for 80 minutes in lecture, right? Like they are moving around. There are built-in breaks within that that 80 minutes um, for them. Uh, but that and and that we were focusing on where advisory. If you look at the eighth and seventh grade, advisory happens around their lunch period. So for eighth grade, a lot of our advisory topics, hopefully will impact some of the poor decision making that our eighth graders make during their lunchtime, right? So it's like, hey, don't, we're learning about this. We're learning about conflict management or making good decisions or, or things like, don't go into lunch now and forget about this. Sure. As well as in seventh grade, it's on the t- after lunch so that we can address some of the things that might be being seen during lunch in that advisory. And that that's oftentimes that we are also like addressing issues from lunch in particularly seventh grade. So if we're dealing with, you know, a group of students who are having some issues and it's boiled over and it, and it came to a head at lunch, like we're able to utilize that 20 minutes of advisory time to get those students together, but they might not be in their advisory class at that time, but we can get those students together to problem solve and, and work through issues that are happening through the social dynamics that we see both in seventh and eighth grade during that 20 minutes and it not be them losing their instructional time or their math class. So we, we purposefully tried to put that on either end of, of lunch for both of those grade levels. Brian, what's, what's the plan for, for the PD aspect of it? Is it like you guys so, are thinking so, about doing something in May and then following up in August? And So ISM's coming back out um, May 24th. Uh, and they're going to be meeting with all of our department chairs. Um, it's going to be a full day with our department chairs. And uh, then they are coming out for the half day. De- they're coming back out then with all of our staff for the half day in the afternoon on the last day of school. And then the morning of our in service day after the last day of school. Uh, that Thursday and Friday for all staff. So it'll be about um, professional development and in-service on the brain science about teaching in longer blocks, um, uh, how to relook at curriculum writing and lesson planning of what you did in 40, specifically like what, how to transition between a traditional like 40, 45 minute period. And then what does that look like in the 80 to 90 minute period? And how do you have to relook at things um, as well as pedagogical shifts of, um, of, of what you need to make. Like I have the, the getting away from the mindset of, I only have you for 45 minutes. So I need to talk and give you as much as possible because I'm limited on time to really making students more active participants in the learning process because right. you have more of that vertical time. And, and how do you change sort of the, that structure of activities that are happening in your class, whether that's science or math or English or an art class, um, you know, what does that look like? Cause, cause one of the concerns I think you, you hear from like math and, and language teachers is like, they need that every day, right? Well, how do you make it so that that 80 minutes that you have with them is more impactful and students have deeper learning opportunities and retain information more because you taught them differently than having them for 40 or 45 over two days, right? So sure. it's about that efficiency and use of time. Oh, it's a huge sit- mindset shift, right? And we, but- wanted to do, we wanted to do that PD before. We didn't want that to be an August professional development, right? Because it's like, you just wasted my whole summer when I would have had some Absolutely. time to be able to plan and think and reflect. So we were trying to get this in before the end of the school year send the teachers off so that they can digest that and have that be part of their summer planning and then return to school mindset and then revisit it again, obviously in the August PD, but not it be the first thing that that'd be the first time they get it. So the, all I'm assuming all the teachers have seen this at this point. Yes, I believe so. Uh, Mr. Messick shared drafts, drafts, the most up uh, the staff. 
The most updated um, and, they have not yet because we made changes after we gotten getting feedback from them already. Uh, when I met with the high school, we got some feedback and Brian and I talked and Brian made some adjustments. So they have not seen this version yet. Something similar though, I'm assuming. Something similar. Yeah. The big thing was we yeah. had advisory zone block. We got feedback from them and that got moved into that lunch and learn type thing. That's really the big change. And then we went from 75 minute blocks to eight minute blocks. But so so Blaze, this is also part of the conversation too that's been difficult. So we had a training with all of the teachers, uh, along with board members that were invited. Stacy Barno ended up going, and um, some of the teachers, most of the teachers were there. And that was a whole day PD of like why we're doing the schedule so they could like understand this, right? Yeah, yeah. Then, I remember Brian we, spoke about that. I remember right. that. So then we did, now we're giving them an opportunity to give feedback based on some of the proposals of the schedule that we have. But what's happening is, depending on how teachers feel, they're starting to trickle it out to kids. And kids are having an opinion about things they don't know anything about. Because we, we're not giving this to kids until we've gotten all the feedback from the teachers, from the strategic planning committee meeting, then we'll propose it to the board. And once we get the board, whether they recommend us to move forward with this, that's when we would deliver it to parents and kids. And that's the conversation would be over trainings with parents, um, you know, webinars, all of that. So a lot of people are getting like half truths about where things are landing. Because oh, yeah, I'm sure half of it's false. About it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's and it's projections of how this will impact me. And I think that that's that's normal um, to have, whether you're a staff member or you're or you're a student. Um but, you know, I think that that's where I said earlier, like, this is sort of what it looks like within the day. And there's still a lot of logistical things that we have to work out. Um, but I think that there are things that are really positive from this. So if I'm an, if I'm a late, we have students who have late arrival right now, they got to come in at, at 823. Um, if, they, if students have a late arrival next next year, they don't got to come in until 905. Uh, I, I think the positives like, far outweigh the negatives from a student's perspective, for sure. All right, there's always going to be some random negatives, but I, I, I don't see anything too serious in terms of negativity from a, from a student perspective at all. Please. I would, I, I would rather teach. I would rather teach like this too. If I were in a classroom, I'd rather teach this schedule. Blaze it's Jerry Ann. I just wanted to, cause you, I think you made a good point about that eighth grade block being really long. And yeah. I wanted to just note that we're looking at a resource through responsive classrooms where it's a very systematic approach to advisory. So it won't feel like you're in the same class. There will be sort of a break and then we move into advisory that has a systematic approach to it. But that um, the skills that are taught through that, not only are they really necessary for our middle school students, but it's also laid out to be um, like four days a week. So there will be a day out of the week where they'll have a little more flexibility. And because our lunch is ending like we're we have a shorter lunch period we want to try and build in more activities and a little bit more movement during that time as well so that makes sense yeah i think that advisory period can be utilized for the needs that we have that could be community building time for our middle school it can and there's lots of things that you can do with it when it's devoted time to something like that Any other questions, comments? It's 835, so I don't want to keep everyone too long. Um, just a, a, a sort of reiteration of what I said before. So the plan would be to give um, something similar to the board uh, next week um, and, and get additional feedback um, from them uh, about us moving forward with this uh, and, and looking to proceed with that professional development and and look to implement uh, this for next year. I, I think that um, with the construction coming up, that that new building then also does give us more space. So I think we can also look at this as potentially like um, what could be the first step towards a final product. This could be the final product if this works for us and we're like, yeah, this is great. And then once we move into new physical physical space in a new building. This continues to work for us and we bring back in PE and, and that and that integrates back into the schedule nicely. Um, or this might be like step one of two steps where then 
it's it's sort of like a launch pad into we we do this for two two years while we're waiting for the building and as the building open is preparing to open and we look at our the actual physical space that we have we can make slight adjustments to this so it can be sort of a, a baby step towards a final product yeah that's the only other thing i thought right like is it is it worth doing this two years prior to going into a new building or is it worth building up to it and going in fresh when you have the new space but i guess you it doesn't really matter I think that we're, we're there are some of the things like high school lunch um, and and the gym space and things like it's getting to a point where uh, we're we're not able to like physically house high school lunch in the forty five minutes anymore, and yeah. because we're on that very structured forty five blo- minute blocks everywhere. Um, we don't really have the ability to create a second high school lunch. They're already eating all the way until like one twenty, like one twenty three. Um, we, you know, we're we. Th- this ends the last lunch is is ending around one o'clock now. Um, so so you know we're 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 compacting our lunch so we don't have kids eating both super early and super late. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so, uh, outdoor, uh, charity, do you mean outdoor recess time for middle school? Yes. Any time where they can just be outdoors, getting some of the, since the class time is extended, say you have a student with ADHD or issues where they already have attention issues. Is there outdoor time for them so that they can have a break from class or? I think that those are things that we would build into. I think so. There's there's a couple different things. So one would be we were that's why we we were looking at elongating some of the transition time. So when the kids do transition, they have a little bit more time. Um, the the lunch peer physical space next year while construction happens in and of itself is going to be extremely limited for recess in general. Um, we're, we're, and that's one of the reasons why we another reason why we looked at the high school PE classes moving to um, this sort of this online format was to try to open up gym space a little bit more so that if we, we may have to have multiple PE, multiple recesses happening both um, in the outdoor space that we do have, as well as the gym during the time that we have been given now that high school PE classes are not happening in there. So we were, we're trying to find as much physical space for recess to be able to occur um, as we can, given the projected uh, site constraints that we're going to have once construction and, and groundbreaking happen, groundbreaking happens. I think that with, within that 120 minutes, what's important for um for our teachers from a instructional design and pedagogy standpoint is that, that, that active learning that students are not sitting for 80 minutes. And I think that that will, that will help students who I I know in meetings that in long meetings that I'm in, like I need to get up, I need to move around um, that that is sort of built into the way that teaching occurs now to help support students who may have attention issues or be hyperactive or need to move around and cannot sit for, for 80 minutes. The expectation is that, I mean, I don't have any expectation that a seventh or eighth grader or even probably a high schooler is able to sit in a seat and not move for 80 minutes and listen to a teacher like that. That's not, that's not developmentally so appropriate. So we're going to look lo- for those times within the day. I think Charity's also asking for, is there going to be that built in downtime for them? And I think the answer is yes. It's just going to be more structured because right now that's our biggest problem is when middle school kids are just walking around aimlessly outside and what they choose to do. And that's causing a lot of problems. So giving them more structured activities during that time, like basketball club, or the green team, or because some kids don't want to do that either. So there are some kids that want to go outside and do that. And there are other kids that want to do art or something else. And so giving them more structured downtime is the plan with some of that time. 
So the, the idea of them going outside, aimlessly walking around and getting themselves in trouble, that we're trying to get away from. Yeah, or just or 180 kids out back just a free for all as, is not beneficial. Um, and that's where kids are getting themselves into trouble. Does that make sense, Charity? It does. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking from the standpoint of having a eighth grade son that I can tell you right now, you'll be good if you get a solid 30 minutes <laughs> where he can listen to a lecture yeah. um, and that. So my, my concern is really, I, I don't see a problem with that high school, but you know, I, middle school I, is a whole different beast. Yeah, I listen, I, I, I've been at a lot of middle schools, even Avangrove's middle school. They don't have built in recess like that. They have structured time outside, but it's structured gym time, extra gym time or this or that. I, yeah, think, I think that the, the I think the actual class, what people don't understand in middle school is that during elementary school, K to six, that's actually what they're doing. They're in a classroom all day long with one teacher, maybe two, but they're in a room all day long. Right. So they actually have done it K to six. The only time they start stopped doing it was in seventh grade. And that's when they actually started experiencing some of that problem because it's so disjointed and transition and kids with ADHD, they really struggle to transition that many times. It's always transition times that they're getting in trouble. So I think that a lot of people look at it like it's this big change, but really they it, it's it's always helped them in elementary school unless they struggled with their one teacher. Right. Like that's usually the problem you have it is is whether if there's a problem with the teacher and that one kid in a day or in an 80 minute period, not necessarily if they can do it. It's about the, the class and if they're interested in it. Yeah, I definitely think how we present it's going to be the biggest factor. I mean, I my agree. high school kid came and was freaking out. Um, we're moving. I love how the kids are freaking out when they haven't even when they don't even know about it yet. Exactly. Supposedly, exactly. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it leaking or however it's doing right now, I think is more detrimental than it actually being presented because it makes sense. I mean, when you're looking at it. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm I'm frustrated because. This is the, this is, we're trying to get input, right? Feedback from the teachers, from the strategic planning committee, taking it back to the board. So there's like a process that you gather all this feedback and how it turns into kids getting upset. That's, that's something I'm trying to understand because we have to be able to talk to people about it to get feedback, mm -hmm. but then we, we end up in this you know, predicament where people are making assumptions before we even have the opportunity to talk to kids or parents about it, which is unfortunate. Right. I just want to clarify, Mr. Mostello did see this as well, right? Mr. Mostello did see this. Just making sure. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. So, like I said, we're 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 still in draft forms and and are looking to um, come to the board next week and and have another discussion and presentation about everything. Um, and in in that uh, place and and um, charity, I will make sure that within it it has um, our our communication plan uh for the board as well like you know post this this is what we plan to continue to do so that they can see um our communication plan out for both parents and students awesome sounds good all right that's all i got for tonight any other questions before we go all right, guys, everybody have a good night. We're going to adjourn at 845. Everybody enjoy their uh, their evening. Have a good one. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. much. Have a good night. You too.